بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمد عينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وشهد الله إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد شعلا then to proceed and to continue uh, with that which we began of a small treaty um, which entails the pillars of al-Islam and an elaboration of the pillars of Iman and a clarification of that and an explanation of that then we began our last session um, clarifying with the introduction of Muqaddimah the introduction mentioning that Islam it is a an aqidah or a belief and likewise it is also sharia or it is legislation as well because as muslims we don't believe that islam is just for ourselves but rather it is something which is practiced in the society benefit the society that islam comes to and so it is practiced and likewise it is held within the hearts of the believers which they carry out in their day-to-day -day, uh, affairs. Now, so we reach the section regarding the arkan of al-Islam, or the pillars of al-Islam. And then the Shaykh begins by saying that the pillars of al-Islam, it is that which Islam is built upon. And they are five, there are five pillars. And then he mentions those, those, five, those five pillars or those five affairs which are mentioned in the narration of Abdullah ibn Umar, ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhumah. May Allah be pleased with both of them. And he mentioned that the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam قال, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Kuni al-Islamu ala khams. That Islam is built upon five. And then he mentions, ala an yuwahid Allah that he mentioned in this particular version, that it is that you single out Allah alone in worship. And then he mentions, and in another narration, he mentions Allah khams, that it is built upon five. Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolu. To bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, and that Muhammad, he is his slave and his messenger. Wa iqam is salah, and to establish the prayer, or ita is zakah, and to give in charity or to give the uh, mandatory charity, wasiyam or Ramadan, and to fast the month of Ramadan, wal hajj, and to perform the pilgrimage. And then he mentioned in this narration, fakala rajul, so a man said, hajj wasiyam Ramadan. I corrected him. He said, no, rather, it is hajj and then fasting in Ramadan. So then Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, La, he said, no. Siyam Ramadan wal Hajj. He said, rather, fasting in Ramadan and Hajj, akadha samituhu min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is how I heard it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is the narration that the shaykh begins with in regards to the pillars of Islam. And in this narration, we find that the companion here he is very stringent in regards to how he narrated the narration. For indeed, there are other narrations that mention that which the person who interrupted or corrected him upon or tried to correct him upon, that the mention of Hajj before Ramadan. But he mentioned, no, rather, this is how I heard it from the Prophet Wasallam, And in this, we'll, as the lessons go on, inshallah, we will, we will highlight, inshallah, the importance of itiba, the importance of following the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam precisely, as much as we are able to. So he mentions, so, that the five pillars in this hadith indicate the following. It says, so the shahada, the shahada, uh, that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger and his slave, then it is an itiqad, or it is a belief, which is jazim, 
which is uh, a, a firm, resounding belief, which is expressed upon the tongue. Either the shahada must be expressed upon the tongue. It is not sufficient for it to just remain in the heart. Right? That it must be expressed upon the tongue and bear, and bore witness to. He said, the person testifying to it makes a firm uh, conviction with this testimony to say that this testimony is something true. As if he is an eyewitness just to an event. So when, you, when we make the shahada, and the word shahada means to testify, it is as though a person is witnessing an event. If you imagine someone being called to a law court and then being called to witness, then it is a must that he must speak or he must convey that which they saw of the event. So therefore, the shahada is a verbal utterance and it is something that affirms that which is in the heart, that which is in the heart of belief. Now, so then he mentions, and even though that this shahada, it is one pillar, it is one rukun, but it covers, testifies to various affairs. Um, he mentions that either it is because the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is the one who conveys the message of Allah. Right? It conveys the message of Allah and thus the testimony to that, he is the slave and the messenger of Allah is a necessary component for the completion of the shahada. I, and when we say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, along with that is Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah or Ashadu anna Muhammad uh, Abduhu wa Rasul. That he is, that Muhammad sallallahu is the slave and the messenger. And this is something that completes the meaning of the reality of one shahada. He says, or oh, it is because these two testimonies, i.e., Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad wa Rasulullah, they are necessary for the correctness and the soundness and the acceptance of one's action. Right? That this, when we say Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, wa Ashadu anna Muhammad and Abduhu wa Rasul, that these two, in reality, they are the conditions for the acceptance of an action in reality. That is what you're affirming. For the soundness of the action. For no deed is complete or accepted unless it fulfills these two conditions. No deed is complete unless it fulfills these two conditions. And he mentions that the action is not correct, neither is it accepted, except by way of, number one, ikhlas, i.e. tawheed ikhlas or sincerity as we say that it is done purely for the sake of Allah uh, the first condition for an action to be accepted by Allah and it must be done solely for him ikhlas then he mentions and mutaba'ah of the messenger and following the Prophet wasallam. this is the second condition so for any action to be accepted by Allah it must fulfill these two conditions. If it does not fulfill these two conditions, then the action is rejected, or the action will not be accepted. Number one, solely for the sake of Allah, and that is when you say, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. So that is the first condition. Then when we say, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, what we are saying in essence, is that that worship of Allah can only be done correctly by following the Prophet Muhammad. Um, so these are the two conditions for an action uh, to be accepted, an act, an action of worship to be accepted by Allah, and it must fulfill these two conditions. Then he mentions, so by doing an act purely for Allah, the testimony La ilaha illallah is brought to reality and fulfilled. And by obeying the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa the testimony of Muhammad is the slave and the messenger, then this is brought into reality and it is fulfilled. Yeah? And what we're saying in reality is that only 
only by way of following the Prophet وسلم, can I fulfill the rights of Allah in his worship. For it is that reason why Allah sent the messenger for. Allah sent him for that, mess- for that purpose. So then he mentions, so from the benefits of this, I, from the benefits of the shahada, this tremendous witness, this tremendous shahada, is the freeing of the heart and the souls from the constriction of being enslaved to the creation. From the benefits of the shahada is the freeing of the hearts and the souls from being constricted to the enslavement of created beings. I I bear witness that nothing or that no one has the right to be worshipped except Allah. That will free the heart and free the soul and free that servant from worshipping anything else that Allah created. Huh? And we'll mention that this statement, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, has two parts to it. Two parts to it. The first part is a negation, and the second part being an affirmation. Ashhadu an la ilaha. I bear witness that nothing or no one has a right to be worshipped. This is a negation. What we are negating here is the negation of anything whatsoever that, ex- that is in existence, that it has a right for our servitude. Nothing in existence has a right for your servitude. And then we have the affirmation, illallah. Illallah, except for Allah. And so this statement is very clear and very profound. There is no ambiguity in it whatsoever. It is making it very clear. It negates everything to be worshipped and then it affirms only for Allah. Right? So this statement it has two parts to it, an affirmation and a negation. I, la ilaha, Illallah. None has the right to be worshipped except Allah. Negation and affirmation. And likewise, he says, وَمِنَ الْإِتِّبَاءَ لِغَيْرِ mursaleen." And this statement from the benefits that it has, it is also, it is that, that, that one should follow other than those who were sent as prophets. Particularly, I mean, if you think about the fact that the Prophet ﷺ and all of the Prophets, they were sent for the purpose of guiding mankind to that which Allah wants from them. And this statement, this shahada, the second part of the shahada, protects the soul, protects the hearts from following anyone other than Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, i.e. blindly, without conditions, unconditionally. And it is this, and in reality, this thing occurred amongst the previous nations, those people who took others instead of the messengers to be followed. And they preferred them over those who were sent with the revelation. And some people even went as far as worshipping those who were sent by Allah. They stay, instead of worshipping Allah through them, i.e. by way of their teachings, they took them as deities besides Allah, like the Jews and the Christians. Instead of worshipping Allah by way of those prophets, they took those prophets due to their piety and due to their righteousness, they took them as gods besides Allah and worshipped them instead of Allah. So this statement, Ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu is very profound, i.e. that the Prophet affirmed time and time again that he is the abd, he is the slave of Allah. So no one should have in their mind that he is deserving of worship. What a soul, and I am the messenger, and I am his messenger, i.e. follow me, obey me in how we should worship our Lord. Abduhu. Rasul. It makes it very, very clear. Right? So that no one can fall into the trap 
of shaitan of glorifying Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa above his station. And he is Muhammad. He is the one who deserves to be praised. He is Muhammad. He is Ahmad, the one who is praiseworthy and deserves the praise. But not beyond that which Allah gave him, uh, gave him by way of status. So the Prophet reiterated it with this statement, uh, Abduhu wa Rasulu. I, I am his slave. I, I worship Allah likewise. And I am his messenger. I am the one who is conveying to you how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, then the Shaykh mentions, so this is the first, the first pillar, i.e. the Shahada. And he mentions the second pillar, and that is Iqamatul Salah. He says that establishment of prayer, it is Ta'abudlillah, it is a devotion and worship of Allah by carrying out or by worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the complete and proper fashion, i.e. the salah, it is an act of worship to Allah which is to be carried out properly, completely, in its prescribed times, and in its correct form, i.e. in the correct fashion. This is how the prayer should be performed. I.e. again, correctly, that it is established correctly. And it is important, and inshallah we will do over the weeks to come, inshallah, learn how to perform the prayer in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallam. Perfectly, completely, in its prescribed times, as we know the prayers have their fixed times, and they should not be done outside of those times, and likewise in the correct form and in the correct fashion. Then he mentions, and from the fruits or from the benefits of the prayer is that it, it opens up the chest. I mean, it, it brings about tranquility in the chest. And it becomes the pleasure of the eye. As we know that the salah was the coolness of the eye of the Prophet sallallahu So whenever a person may be going through any difficulties or hardship, one of the first things that we should resort to is the prayer whether it be the obligatory prayers, five daily prayers, or other than it, or other, other than them, sorry, the recommended prayers or the sunan prayers. Right? So from the benefits is that it opens up the chest or it uh, brings about tranquility, and it is the pleasure of the eye. And likewise, it is, it's something that protects and forbids a person from lewdness and fasha and munkar. It uh, prevents a person from sexual immorality, and likewise, munkar, evil, evil practices. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions concerning the prayer, Allah bi dhikrillahi fatma'inul kuloob. Is it not then with the remembrance of Allah that the hearts find tranquility? That's the reality. The hearts find tranquility with the prayer. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, inna salata tanha anil fashai wal munkar. That the prayer, it forbids from sexual immorality, and likewise evil practice. These are from the benefits of the prayer. Not to mention that if a person prays in jama'ah, then it brings the hearts together of the believers. And there are so many, many numerous benefits from the prayer, whether it is done individually or whether it's done in congregation. Then it mentions the third pillar. The third pillar being, wa'ita is zakah. And to give or to pay the zakah or to pay the charity. And he mentions that it is a, an act of devotion or act of worship by offering a prescribed mandatory amount of wealth as a means of purification. And this is a right or a, a due right of purification of that wealth. Again, that it is the submitting or the, the, the offering of a fixed mandatory amount of wealth as a due right and purification of that wealth. That is the zakah. 
And the zakah, no doubt, it is from the best of the uh, purifications of one's wealth. There are other, other types, such as sadaka or giving in charity, but this is upon the one who meets the level or the, the threshold of wealth that makes purification of his wealth mandatory, makes it obligatory. I, he must pay the zakah if he is eligible to do so. Inshallah, that will come later. We're just covering over the basics of the, uh, the pillars. They so mentions so from, from, the, from the benefits or from the fruits of this is that it is a purification of the soul from miserly and characteristics. Having these stingy characteristics, I always wanting to, you know, gather and keep and amass wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us with paying the zakah. Paying the zakah and from the benefits of this is that it frees the soul, removes the soul from the characteristics of being stingy. Um, and also by way of that payment... It is a fulfillment and it meets the requirements of those other Muslims who are in need of it. Who are in need of it. And inshallah, we'll give ourselves a reminder here that this zakah, it is a small amount, 2.5%. It's all a small amount of one's wealth. It is not a huge amount. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing it for the benefit of our own souls. Because mankind is inclined quite often towards the life of this world. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, al haqum the mutual, the mutual rivalry and, you know, between one another in regards to amassing, amassing this wealth. Yeah? And it deceives you. Deceives you from what? That which is more important than it. And that which is more important than it is the life of the hereafter. I.e., you become diverted away from the life of the hereafter due to trying to amass and gather more and more and more. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hatta zurtumul makabir. It will divert you up until you visit your grave, i.e., up until death. Kalla sofa ta'lamun. Then you will come to know. Allah then reiterates, then again, you will come to know. What will you come to know? You will know that that pursuit that you were chasing after in regards to the amassing of wealth, it wasn't worth it. And what you should have done is focused upon the life of the hereafter. Focusing upon the life of the hereafter, that is why in reality we are here. We are here in order to become worshippers, better worshippers, fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing those things to bring us closer to Allah. Closer to Allah. So don't become, you know, diverted from the hereafter due to the life of this world. So if you are from those who uh, yeah, and, um, are eligible to pay the zakah, pay the zakah. Don't be stingy. Don't try to keep onto this wealth and hold onto this wealth. Right, so moving on, then he mentions the fourth pillar then, and that is Saum Ramadan. That is fasting in the month of Ramadan. And he says that it is, again, an act of worship to Allah, the Most High, where a person withholds from those things which will break the fast. It is an act of worship which a person does that is, and, and that is to withhold from those things which will break the fast during the daytime of Ramadan. During the daylight hours or during the day of Ramadan. I.e. from the rising of the sun to when it sets then the siyam is to withhold from whatever may break the fast, whether it be food or drink or other than that. Other than, and these are the main two, or from the main two, the food and the drink, and having relations. And then anything other than that that may break the fast, 
then it is to refrain from those things, stay away from those things. So he mentions, and from the fruits of that, i.e., from the fruits of Ramadan, and from the benefits of Ramadan, is that it trains the soul upon abandoning those things which are beloved to them, i.e., these mahbubat, or these things which are beloved to the person and seeking thereby the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the fasting, it trains and it cultivates and it nurtures the believer upon leaving those things which are beloved to him. And the things that are beloved to him from that which is halal. Not talking about the things which are beloved to the person of that which is haram talking about leaving and abandoning those things which are halal for a person, lawful for a person, but within the daylight hours he abandons them, seek the pleasure of his Lord. Additional benefit from this is that if a person can abandon those halal things which are beloved to him, then how much more easier will it be to abandon those things which are haram our beloved if you can abandon the halal food and drink and one's wife lawful then how about those things which are haram and a person may have a desire for them even more so it would be even easier and so this is a training of the souls it trains and cultivates the hearts trains and cultivates the souls of mankind upon abandoning that which is haram Abandon that which is haram, and it's even easier if you can abandon, or which, which will be made easier if a person can abandon those things which are lawful and beloved to him. The fifth pillar then he mentions Hajj, Hajj al Bayt, or making the pilgrimage to the house, i.e., the house of Allah, which was built for his worship solely. He said that this, likewise, is an act of worship where a person intends to travel to the house, the Bayt al-Haram, or the sacred house. And that is for the establishment of the rites of Hajj, in order to establish the rites um, of Hajj, whether that be the Tawaf, i.e. circumambulating around the Kaaba, or whether it be the Sa'i, going between Safar and Marwa, and the other acts that are connected with Hajj, going to Muzdalifah, going to Mina, the stoning of the Jamarat, and so on. All of these acts have been done in the slaughtering likewise. All of these acts are done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says that it is, he says, um, so from the benefits or from the fruits of this, is that it trains the soul upon yani, undertaking uh, and striving with one's wealth and one's body. With the wealth and one's body. If you notice the previous pillars, they were either one or the other. Whereas the Hajj, it incorporates so many different acts of worship. So many different acts. So a person will spend his wealth, whether it be by the, the spending of to travel, no, whether it's a plane or a boat or a car or whatever a person uses to get there. And likewise, striving with one's body, spending the days in the, the designated areas, the, the stoning, being you know, surrounded by many thousands of people or millions of people and the difficulty and the hardship that you have to go through. The one who can do that then he, was, he is cultivating his soul upon expending and exerting himself, striving with his wealth and with his body in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can al-Hajj? No, an. That this Hajj is of two types, he mentioned, of, is a type of jihad in the path of Allah. Type of jihad in the path of Allah and will add particularly for the women. Particularly, specifically, for the women. 
And this is based upon the narration from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that she asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam concerning jihad for women. Concerning jihad for women. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he, rem- he responded Naam alayhinna jihad Yes, there is a jihad for women. La kitalun fihi. However, there's no fighting in it. It's a jihad, but there's no fighting in it. Right? So specifically for the women, uh, the, the, the hajj is a type of jihad for them. A jihad for them. They mentions, so the benefits that we have mentioned here and many others that are not mentioned are the means to purify the Muslim nation, right? the community or the Muslim society, and establish it upon the religion of truth, worshipping Allah sincerely and acting with justice towards his creatures, right? towards the rest of mankind, and likewise even to the animals, to act with justice towards the creatures. So if these basic fundamentals and Islamic laws are correct and they are done, then whatever, whatever is other than these actions are built upon will also be correct. Again, so if these basic foundations of Islamic law are correct, whatever other actions are built upon them will also be correct. This is why they are referred to as the Arkan al-Islam or the pillars of al-Islam. They are the fundamental pillars. They are, if, we get, if one needs to get these correct, sound, so that the other acts or the other affairs of Islam would also likewise be correct. So these are the foundation. So the, the Muslim nation and community will only prosper and be successful by fulfilling its religious obligations. Falling short in fulfilling these obligations will deprive them of the success and prosperity. I, if we fall short in our basic fundamental rights in these pillars of al-Islam, then we will not reap the benefits or the true benefits and the fruits thereof. And the most fundamental of them is the first one, i.e. the affair of Tawheed. For every act is based upon it. Every act is based upon it. So then the Shaykh mentions brings the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلُ الْكُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّكَوْ لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبُوا فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the meaning, and if only the people of the town had believed and had piety, i.e. feared Allah, and had fear of Allah, then we would have opened, we would open for them the blessings from the heavens and the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you fear him, and if you carry out that which we are supposed to carry out, then he will open up for us the blessings from the heavens and the earth, i.e. Allah will send down rain, and Allah will bring forth vegetation, and so on. He said, however, they rejected the truth of the messengers. So Allah took them for what they used to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took them, I punished them for what they used to do. And then he mentions the meaning, so do the people of the town feel secure against the coming of our punishment by night? whilst they are asleep? Or do, they, or do the people of the towns feel secure against the coming of our punishment in the afternoon whilst they are at play or whilst they are going about in their daily lives? Do they feel secure against the plan of Allah? Indeed, none feel secure from the plan of Allah except the people who are in lust and doomed. So, by carrying out the or the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us with, 
this will bring about success and honor for this ummah. And so when we look at the ummah currently, and we see the turmoil that the Muslim nation are going through, the solution that will rectify those problems is us making a return back to Al-Islam. Making a return back to the Islam that the Prophet Sallallahu came with and that which his companions were upon. As for what we see, people trying to bring about solutions with things that were not legislated and not commanded, and this will only increase, this will only increase the difficulty upon the Ummah. This will only increase it. So, if we want to aid our brothers and sisters, wherever they may be, in the different lands and the different places, from the best ways is calling to this, this call, like the call of Islam, the call of the Quran, the call of the Sunnah, the call of the Salaf, and bringing and calling people back to that way, because that is the only thing that will truly rectify this Ummah. Any other so-called solution will only bring about harm. Inshallah, we'll, so he mentioned, and we'll com conclude with this, the Shaykh mentions, so if we examine the histories of the peoples of the world and you see lessons for those that take heed and are unbiased and with Allah's aid, Allah's aid is sought, inshallah, we'll complete with that for, uh, conclude with that for today, inshallah. Barakallah feekum. And then we'll move on to the pillars of Iman in